Welcome to the Reading for Your Life podcast. I hope everyone is staying safe and as isolated as possible. As I record this, we're in the throes of the COVID-19 outbreak, and I've been physically isolating for something like eight weeks now, but the good news is I've had plenty of time to read. This month, we're talking about Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near. It was published in 2005, and I want you to remember that date, because everything that we're about to talk about is from 2005. A lot of what Kurzweil predicts is already starting to come true. Let's start with a little bit about Ray Kurzweil. Some of what I'm about to talk about is going to sound like straight-up science fiction, so I want to be really clear up front. Ray Kurzweil is widely regarded as a legitimate genius. He's a guy that knows what he's talking about. At 15, he wrote a computer program that analyzed the patterns of classical composers and synthesized songs in a similar style. That was in 1963. It was so impressive that season two of the HBO show American Gods used that exact same plot point in 2019 to show how brilliant one of its characters was. When Kurzweil actually did it, he won the International Science Fair and was chosen by the Westinghouse Talent Search as a national winner. Kurzweil later studied under Marvin Minsky at MIT, a giant in the computer science world. He took all of the computer programming courses offered at MIT in the first year and a half. And during his spare time in his sophomore year, he wrote a computer program that matched high school students with colleges based on thousands of criteria from a student questionnaire. He sold that program for $100,000, or the equivalent of about three quarters of a million adjusted to $2020. He went on to found a series of innovative technologies— The Kurzweil Reading Machine is a system that could scan any printed text and read it aloud. He debuted the finished design in 1976, and then sold a version of that system to LexisNexis, who used it to scan legal documents and news into their online databases. In 1984, he invented the Kurzweil K250, a machine that could imitate the sound of musical instruments so exactly that musicians couldn't tell the difference between a human playing a real piano and the synthesized sounds of the machine. The system could also record and mix compositions, which made it essentially a single-system orchestra. Kurzweil won a technical Grammy for it. He invented one of the first speech recognition programs, and then in 1987, he started an educational company to help leverage technology for people with disabilities like blindness, dyslexia, and ADHD. He founded a medical company to help train doctors through the use of technology, and he invented a computer system to generate art and poetry. He founded a hedge fund just to train an AI system on how the market works, and in 2012, he was hired by Larry Page to bring natural language processing to Google. Oh, and then he's also written seven books, five of which have been bestsellers. All of that has won him a lot of accolades. In 1999, he was a National Medal of Technology and Innovation winner, which is the U.S.'s highest honor in technology. In 2001, he won the Lemelson MIT Prize. In 2002, the National Inventors Hall of Fame inducted him. PBS called him one of 16 revolutionaries who made America. Inc. Magazine rated him the number 8th most fascinating entrepreneur in the U.S. And this is my favorite quote, calling him Edison's rightful heir. So once again, I say all of that to give credibility to what I'm about to say. Kurzweil makes it plain what this book is about. He puts it right there in the title. The singularity is near. Singularity is a term borrowed from physics. It means a point at which our understanding of the laws of physics and our ability to predict outcomes using math starts to break down. So for instance, the event horizon of a black hole is a singularity, or whatever existed in a microsecond before the Big Bang is another. All we know is that the math doesn't work. Something was on the other side, but as far as we know, there are entirely different rules on the other side. And since we don't know enough about it, we can't really say much for certain about what's happening. The singularity that Kurzweil is pointing to is a technological singularity, based on an idea that he introduced in his earlier book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. That idea is technological acceleration. Do you know how it feels like the world is moving faster and faster? It's because in a lot of ways, it is. The basic idea here is that as things get faster, they get even faster. Throughout human history, the march of progress has seemed slow but consistent. Where it took thousands of years for spoken language to pop up, the archaeological record shows writing evolving independently a couple of different times. It was about 4,500 years between the earliest evidence of human written language and then the invention of the printing press, then about 300 years to the invention of radio, 
then 100 years to television and about 50 years to the invention of the internet. Wi-Fi comes about 10 years after that. Now, all of those milestones are technologies for transmitting information. And if you take them as a whole, you could write that whole thing off as a steady clockwork of advancement. But Kurzweil points out something very interesting that shows up over and over again as you look at the development of different technologies. They're accelerating. If technology advanced predictably, you'd expect to plot out major milestones on a graph and see a nice steady rise. Say, if you were going to look at the number of transistors on a microchip each year, let's say, or how much it costs for a kilowatt hour of power to be held in a battery. If innovation is a case of steady refinement, you'd expect to see a pretty consistent gain year after year. Say, things getting 10% better consistently for decades. But that's not what happens. In fact, you see what's called an exponential curve. If that doesn't mean anything to you, it's usually described as a hockey stick curve, because as it progresses left to right, it starts to rise rapidly and makes a sharp curve upwards, like the bend in a hockey stick. Kurzweil shows graph after graph plotting out major milestones in a slew of different areas. Growing computer power for decreasing costs. Increased DNA sequencing capabilities for less money. Growth in memory storage. Increases in internet data and access. Decreases in the size of mechanical devices that can be manufactured, which is now leading to fields like nanotech. Over and over, our ability to capture, store, and process information is getting faster and better. And I don't know about you, but I take his point. My father remembers programming the computer at his college with a box full of punch cards and saving up for his first home PC, which was roughly the same cost as a new car at the time. Today, he, like most of us, walks around with a smartphone in his pocket and uses a laptop that costs maybe a few hundred dollars to Zoom meeting into Easter quarantine dinner with the family. Kurzweil's point is that the level of acceleration that we see in technology isn't slowing down anytime soon. And that means we need to be ready for the ultimate disruption, the singularity. It took thousands and thousands of years of human existence before we invented simple mechanical counters, then hundreds more before mechanical machines were made programmable. It wasn't until the last 50 or so years that we really started to scale those systems, but the rapid rate of acceleration has given us the smartphone, video conferencing, and VR goggles. All of those are pulled straight out of science fiction from Jules Verne to Star Trek. With all of the rapid evolution in computer science, computers are getting smarter. And I don't mean just speeding up. I mean they're getting smarter. Computers are getting better at solving a wider range of problems. A few episodes ago, we talked about Yuval Noah Harari's 21 Rules for the 21st Century and the rapid evolution of AI for chess and Go. Systems that once tried to overpower the games by throwing massive amounts of computing power towards deciphering possible endgames are now dealing in nuance. Today's best game-playing computers don't have to be as powerful as their predecessors because they understand the game in a different way. AlphaGo, Google's AI called AlphaZero, specifically tooled for the strategy game Go, learned the game in only a few hours playing against itself. And then it beat one of the top-ranked players in the world while playing a beautiful game. In Go, the goal is not only to win, but to do so with creativity. Experts who analyzed AlphaGo's play were amazed by more than the moves it chose. They were impressed with the overall style of play, and human players have begun to adopt new strategies pioneered by the AI. So think about that. With both chess and Go, games with millions of possible plays and that have been agonized over by incredibly smart humans for thousands of years are being innovated by AI systems that learn the game basically by getting a rule sheet and then playing alone. Kurzweil asks us to consider what happens as similar systems take on more and more of the world. AI systems already trade stocks and help route your online orders for the fastest delivery. They're embedded in your life in a million ways. And for now, they're still relatively dumb. And AI mostly can't write itself or check its own code for bugs, but That may not be true very soon. Researchers have already started to write programs that can write themselves. We've already seen with Google's AlphaZero that in the right conditions, AI programs can learn about the world in order to begin making their own decisions. Remember how I said earlier that Kurzweil founded an investment firm just to teach his machine learning stock trading algorithm more about how the market worked? All these machines are getting smarter and smarter, and they're attaining new levels of intelligence both in raw processing speed, but also in their ability to understand the world around them and make decisions on how to interact. 
Machines have already surpassed the intelligence of single cells and bacteria, and we're quickly seeing them approach the intelligence of things like insects. The law of accelerating progress says that the distance from no computer to a computer with the processing capability of a bacteria will be about twice as long as the distance between that point and a computer with the intelligence of an insect, and then maybe half that time to the intelligence of a smaller invertebrate, like a mouse. The progress becomes faster and faster, and in nearly the blink of an eye, we're likely to have computers with the intelligence of a human being. But it doesn't stop there. A computer with the intelligence of an average human can begin to understand itself. How long before that same AI is now as intelligent as the smartest human, or a group of our smartest humans, or even all of humanity combined? Kurzweil points to that time frame as a universe-altering moment in human history. Because when an AI can begin to improve itself in earnest, no rest, no funding meetings, no time to take care of basic biological needs, its intelligence will increase so quickly that all of our past experience and rules go completely out the window. We have absolutely no idea what's on the other side. It's a singularity. Our ability to make predictions just can't reach past that moment. The only thing that we know is that it will be different than anything we've experienced before. Now, despite our inability to see beyond a technological singularity, one of the things that makes this book so compelling to me is that Kurzweil does his best to give us a tour of the possibilities. There's a pretty hard turn at this point towards what feels like science fiction, but I want you to remember Ray Kurzweil's credentials. This guy isn't a fiction writer dreaming up impossible scenarios. This is some of the best researched and cited science fiction that you're ever going to come across. One obvious thing to look forward to is drastically faster and more powerful computing. We're already starting to see this with IBM and Google racing for new advances in quantum computing. There are probably a hundred ways that computing power and speed will continue to progress, things like chip capacity, materials, and data storage. But let's focus on quantum computing for a second as one of the most novel technologies emerging. In 2005, when this book came out, Kurzweil predicted the emergence of quantum computing in Chapter 3, but he admits at that point it was mostly theoretical. In quantum computing, subatomic particles like electrons or photons stand in for electrical signals in your average desktop computer. But because of the unusual behavior of the quantum scale, certain kinds of computation can be done much, much faster than traditional computers. There's a great wiki article about the timeline of quantum computing if you want to see the advancement of the field laid out. In the 0405 time frame, physicists were just starting to move from theory to practice, and were running some of the earliest experiments to prove quantum entanglement. Over the next handful of years, scientists found new ways of capturing, storing, and manipulating subatomic particles until the late 2000s, when the first claims of a true quantum computer started to appear. At first, there was a lot of skepticism of whether the earliest machines were really using quantum-based methods. There were claims of stretching the definitions or even outright fraud. I remember reading articles from the time with names like Why Quantum Computing is Impossible. Maybe this is a good time for a quote that Kurzweil uses in the book. If a scientist says that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. But if he says that it's impossible, he is very probably wrong. From Arthur C. Clarke. With that said, in October of 2019, Google claimed to have passed a threshold called quantum supremacy, which means that a quantum computer was able to solve a problem that a traditional computer can't. According to Google, their system achieved in 200 seconds what would have taken the world's most powerful supercomputer 10,000 years to solve. To be fair, IBM disputed the claim, saying that the supercomputer would only have needed about two and a half days. But still, stop and think about that. The best claim that rival IBM, also developing their own quantum computing systems, could make was that Google's system was a thousand times faster than the world's most powerful supercomputer. And it's only accelerating. One of the many limitations to quantum computing has been that it requires incredible cold, like colder than open space levels of cold. We're talking about near absolute zero. Or at least it did, because last month in April of 2020, researchers in Australia announced a new process that would allow them to operate 15 times hotter than before. Now, it's still pretty cold, but now that level can be achieved with a few thousand dollars worth of cooling equipment instead of the million dollars of supercooling systems required before. Not only that, the way that they've done it is by producing a quantum processor embedded on a silicon chip. 
That process can also use existing silicon chip manufacturing capabilities to scale a lot faster. So be prepared to hear about a lot more thresholds falling in quantum computing over the next few years. Another area that Kurzweil explores is how we interface with these increasingly powerful machines. We sometimes think about removing the limitations of keyboards and mice by using multi-sensory inputs like retina tracking, speech recognition, or movement tracking. But what if computers were part of your actual brain? Kurzweil talks about possibilities for interfacing with nanomachines that live in your bloodstream to monitor your health, or using brain implants to increase your intelligence, or simply being able to log into the internet to Google any questions that come to mind, or even Matrix-style picking up kung fu and helicopter piloting. We could just upload the entirety of a K-12 education, or heck, toss in a PhD, right into the human brain. Imagine skipping thousands of hours listening to lectures and regurgitating facts, and instead just importing all of human history from a central repository. Sounds a lot like science fiction, right? It's most definitely not. Artificial retinas already exist and are getting better rapidly. Light sensors can actually interface directly with the brain to return very basic information. Resolution is low right now, but it's getting better all the time. New advances in organic semiconductors may soon help the computer brain link work better. And NASA has issued a $5 million award towards the development of a protein-based artificial retina. Turns out that manufacturing the devices in microgravity, meaning in space aboard the International Space Station, may help create lighter, better retinas. And this isn't just in the lab. In January of 2020, doctors at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center implanted a new wireless artificial retina. There's a tiny clip inserted under the non-functioning retina, directly attached to the optic nerve. And then a pair of augmented reality glasses with a camera wirelessly streams information to the implant, which is then passed to the optic nerve as electrical signals to the brain. But let's say that hijacking an existing neural link like the optic nerve to restore vision is an entirely different thing than direct computer brain links for things like intelligence augmentation then you're going to want to know about the work being done at Massachusetts General Hospital by Dr. Sean Patel. In an interview in late 2019 for Nautilus magazine, Dr. Patel talks about his work in brain mesh, a state-of-the-art prosthesis that uses ultra-small tissue-like probes to monitor and send electrical signals directly inside the brain. With these interfaces, researchers are able to monitor brain function in an entirely new way and are gaining new insights into mental disorders and overall brain function. In animal tests, they've also been able to selectively stimulate certain parts of the brain to speed up learning and retention. The team is about to begin its first human trials, and given that some human speech can already be deciphered simply by monitoring brain function, Dr. Patel sees a promising future for these brain links. Instead of using lists of symptoms to diagnose mental disorders, which is how psychology mostly works today, these systems could directly monitor brain function and provide much faster and more precise diagnoses. When asked about using the device to potentially enhance our intelligence, Dr. Patel said this, Let's say that I've already developed the AI. Maybe it's a robot or a voice detection algorithm. What I want to do is to merge the bandwidth from that device to my brain. It's not that I need to download the world's knowledge to my brain and have my own brain process it to develop an algorithm internally. We already have Google to do that. What I really want to be able to do is to enable us to use the sensory input that I have. He imagines looking at a boat and then having his brain automatically interface with a vast repository of knowledge like the internet to return the kind of boat that it is and how much it costs. Again, Kurzweil wrote in 2005 of what's becoming reality about 15 years later. Virtual reality is another incredible area of advancement. For a look at a fever dream of what virtual reality could have become, go back and watch the 1992 film The Lawnmower Man. For a more recent and maybe realistic update, check out Ready Player One. Self-contained virtual reality headsets are already on the market for under $500. Tools like the PlayStation VR from Sony or Rift S and Go from Oculus. If you look up pictures from the early days of virtual reality, like those in Jerron Lanier's books, the headsets were heavy and cumbersome with their bundles of wires. People would get motion sick from the simulations, and the headsets would make them top-heavy and prone to falling over. The computing limitations were as much of a barrier to immersive VR as the headsets, but now with massive leaps forward in both computing technology and the visual displays, we may be at the edge of a new generation of virtual reality. With more access and more mature systems, expect to see new applications for VR emerging in the next few years. One of the most surprising areas to me was nanotechnology. 
Kurzweil predicted that the 2020s would be the decade that nanotech really started to scale up in a big way. So sitting in 2020, I looked around and didn't really see any nanotechnology in my own life. So I thought, hey, well, Ray, you can't win them all, right? Except I was wrong. Market estimates predict a $2 billion global market for nanotech by 2025. That's double the industry value in 2018. So by Kurzweil's estimates, that means we'd expect the industry to gain about the same amount of ground again in about the next three years after that, before the end of the decade. That points to nanotechnology becoming a lot more common by the end of the 2020s. Already, companies like Ginkgo Bioworks and Zymergen describe themselves as organism engineers, offering services like organic prototyping, DNA synthesis, and strand development for applications in pest control, breaking down waste plastics, and highly targeted cancer treatments. They're engineering organisms at the molecular scale, tailor-made for very specific jobs. And if that doesn't sound like the future, I don't know what does. Now further out, Kurzweil makes some even more incredible claims, like humans coming to truly understand consciousness and gaining the ability to upload oneself to a digital brain, or the ability to manipulate the local laws of physics, not to travel faster than light, because that's impossible, but by making light travel faster, we could just tag along, or maybe manipulating our genome to extend our lifespans nearly indefinitely. Now I know it all sounds impossible, but an article in the New York Times from early April 2020 introduces Dr. Douglas Blackiston and his Xenobots. Biological robots evolve by algorithm to solve simple puzzles and problems. The work of Dr. Blackiston and his colleagues is already blurring the line between the mechanical and the biological. It's hard not to believe that anything really is possible. And that brings us to one of the biggest potential game changers of all, artificial intelligence. One of the most clear-cut moments of singularity for Kurzweil happens at the very specific moment of AI becoming smarter than all human beings. As processing power increases and machine learning is applied to more and more problems, machines will surpass human intelligence. Hard stop. Whether the machine has true consciousness or not may be up for debate right now, but the smart money is that human intelligence will not be on top for very much longer. Kurzweil sets that date for the singularity around 2040. We're already using AI in a ton of different ways. One system uses a series of cameras to help sort berries, monitoring texture and the color to process more than 2,400 berries per second. It can differentiate a stem hole from a punctured berry, ripe fruit from unripe, and then sort them appropriately. Or, and this one really blew my mind, what about potato chips? AI systems are currently in use to standardize potato size, determining the optimal peeling process and ensuring perfect consistency. The system can monitor chip thickness and frying time more exactly than any human tester ever could. A representative for a chip company who uses the technology made the comment, when was the last time that you saw a green or burned chip? Now, I know it's silly, but that stopped me in my tracks. In the 90s, Cartoons used to make jokes about the burned weird chip that you'd often find at the bottom of the bag. It turns out human potato sorters had to manually check for bad spuds one at a time. If a bad potato slipped through, it would be processed and end up in your bag. The new AI-driven systems can monitor more stages of the manufacturing process, and they can do it faster, resulting in a more consistent end result. We're all living in the potato chip future, and we never even realized it. Another unsuspected but fascinating use for AI is archaeology. AI systems have been taught to read satellite images for the telltale signs of ancient burial mounds. Using publicly available satellite scans, a team was able to identify over 70 new dig sites in an area of 1,000 square kilometers, a feat that would have taken thousands of hours of humans looking at pictures and probably wouldn't have been nearly as accurate. An article on Singularity Hub details dozens of ways that machine learning and AI are being used in archaeology, from determining linguistic roots of different languages to determining the chemical composition of ancient dyes and inks. AI is accelerating the work and deepening our understanding. AI systems are even writing persuasive essays and engaging in human-style debates, leveraging ideas, meaning, and concepts in novel ways to construct argument. These systems are not what we call conscious yet, but we don't really know where they'll go. If consciousness is truly an emergent property, it's possible they could gain consciousness as we get better and better at recreating human thought patterns. 
Or we may discover a different way for intelligence to exist, or even a different form of consciousness than anything we've experienced before. There are generally three possible futures. One is a good AI. The systems become much smarter than us, and they use those abilities to solve all or most of our problems, helping us extend our lifespans and live happier, easier lives. Or, of course, there's the potential for bad AI. The machines take over, or they turn against us. Or even if they're neutral or benevolent, the gains are distributed so narrowly that the gulf between the haves and have-nots divide us into nearly separate species. When you hear about Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, or Elon Musk warning about AI, this is the future they want to avoid. Now, if we have the good and we have the bad, another possibility is the weird, best exemplified in a TED Talk by Janelle Shane. If technology develops faster than we're able to understand the questions it will ask and the answers that it will need, We have no idea what the outcome would be. An example that Janelle gives in her talk is an AI that was trained to recognize a certain kind of fish. The AI was trained on hundreds of pictures of the fish and then asked to draw it. Oddly, the machine drew weird appendages on the fish's stomach. When researchers dug deeper, they realized that the photos that they'd shown the fish were a fisherman holding up their trophy catch with their fingers in full view. The machine learned the lesson we meant for it to learn, but we accidentally taught it something else too. Or take the case of an AI trained to eliminate hiring bias. An AI was fed the resumes of accepted and rejected applicants and told to process new candidates to make a hiring decision. It was soon discovered that the system learned to avoid female candidates because they'd been rejected historically. So in fact, the machine learned a bias towards male candidates and treated it as a rule of the process. AI systems that have been taught human language through Twitter have suffered similar problems and ended up both mean and racist. I think the weird is the most likely scenario in my mind. If AI is our child, but we're not ready for its questions, it may be hard for the tool to live up to its full potential right away. Now, this podcast is supposed to be about books that pose big questions for our lives. So here it is. What kind of future do we want, and are we ready? With the COVID-19 pandemic, there will be more pressure than ever to automate and integrate our lives with the virtual. Kurzweil says that many of our dearly held assumptions about the nature of machines, and indeed of our own human nature, will be called into question in the next several decades. I think he's right. The world is accelerating in incredible ways. We're already on the cusp of mind-blowing breakthroughs that will extend our intelligence, elongate our lifespans, and interconnect us in ways that seem like science fiction today. And we know it because we already see it happening. The singularity means that we can't imagine what our lives will be like on the other side, but we can decide what is important to us and what we want to preserve. What is essentially human? What is the purpose of a human life? A few months ago, we looked at 21 lessons for the 21st century and some of the challenges that Yuval Noah Harari expects us to face. In an interview with the science publication Nautilus in 2018, Harari expanded on the challenges that big data, AI, and machine learning present. There are things we can do to improve the situation, he said, but there is nothing inevitable about it. I'm not a believer that science and technology will inevitably create a better world. Science and technology guarantee only one thing. This thing is power. Humankind is going to become more powerful. What will you do with all that power? Thank you for listening to Reading for Your Life. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I'd love to hear from you at modernpolymaths at gmail.com, Modern Polymaths on Twitter, or Modern Polymaths Media on Facebook. You can also check out modernpolymaths.com for past episodes and various musings on big questions about life. On the next episode, I'll share Matthew Crawford's The World Beyond Your Head, and we'll talk a little bit about how grounding ourselves in a physical reality and how slowing down a little can be a powerful antidote to our modern digital bustle. Until next time, this has been Alex, and I wish you the best life imaginable.